So now uh, moving on to the, to the practitioners in the trenches. So Stephen, uh, given what we all just laid out and these most recent uh, Ninth Circuit cases, um, what do you as a plaintiff's lawyer make out as what's happening uh, mainly in the Ninth Circuit uh, and, and, their, and the ability to make a motion to dismiss and to win or to lose on one? Thank you, Jock. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to go back to kind of a happier time in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, there was a case that um, was fought by uh, Mr. Nimmer and Mr. Patrick. Uh, it's called, it's the Battlestar Galactica case. It's um, 20th Century Fox Film Corp versus MCA. And it was a very short opinion. The court reversed uh, the lower court and said that summary judgment was not appropriate uh, in that situation because um, the plaintiff, uh, represented by Mr. Nimmer, had identified about 11 similarities between um, Battlestar Galactica and Star Wars. And the court said, well, you know, reasonable minds could differ on this. And so we're not saying anybody's right, but this is a factual question that should go to a jury. Um, the court laid out in a very short opinion, three pages, when it's appropriate to decide summary judgment and presumably motions for dismiss as well, said that only in the most clearest of cases, where there's literally virtually no similarities or dis de minimis similarities, would it be appropriate. And then soon after that, there was the Shaw case, Shaw versus Lindheim in 1990, where the court said uh, that they actually found substantial similarity, again, reversing the lower court. They said that, um, that the selection, the sequence of events was enough of a pattern to establish substantial similarity between the two works. Then you have the famous, well, pretty famous, only Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court case on this issue, the Feast versus Rural Phone Book case that came out in 1991. And in that case, the court laid out basically what, what I refer to as the selection and arrangement test, and it's been called the selection and arrangement test. And that test is, is, is essentially this. We don't eliminate anything ab initio. We, put every, we throw everything into the pot. We throw ideas, we throw characters, we throw plot, we throw um, scenes of fare, everything you can possibly think of. And then we look to see if there's a pattern there and whether that pattern was repeated in the defendant's work. And if so, there's infringement. And that's commonly referred to as the selection and arrangement test. So then what happened, fast forward to 2002, you have two pivotal cases in the Ninth Circuit, one being Metcalf versus Bochco, which did follow the selection and arrangement test, and the court found that six similarities in the plaintiff's work was enough to establish substantial similarity for purposes of copyright infringement. But that same year, you have a case called Cavalier versus Random House. And in that case, the court determined that instead of throwing everything into the pot, the court would first eliminate any um, uh, elements that were non-protectable, and that's commonly referred to as the filtration test. And the problem with that is, every time a court applies the filtration test, there's nothing ever, ever left at the end of the day, because when you deconstruct the work into its separate elements, and then figure out whether each element is protectable or not, they never are. Everything's been done before. Uh, it's impossible to find any element that's actually new and unique. And, and, and the cases say, is it an idea? Oh, well, it's an idea, it's not an expression. Eliminated. Is it a character? Eliminated. General plot? Eliminated. Scene affair? Eliminated. So when they're done, uh, for example, in the Shame on You case, uh, the court went through a 65-page opinion and eliminated every single similarity uh, and, and was then left with three similarities that she couldn't eliminate and ultimately just said those were a de minimis. So when the filtration test is applied, which was uh, first um, initiated in the Cavalier versus Random House case in 2002, plaintiffs never, ever win and, and have no chance of winning. Um, but... Um, there's also sort of a separate line of cases uh, that have applied the selection and arrangement test. In fact, even the studios sometimes uh, uh, use the selection and arrangement test. For example, in 2016, uh, in a case, I have here, it's a Paramount case regarding soundtrack, uh, uh, Star Trek, the court applied uh, the selection and arrangement test to rule in favor of Paramount. Uh, because the defendants had been uh, doing sort of a, a Star Trek knockoff, I believe, and um, they found that there was sufficient similarity to, um, to find uh, potential infringement there. 
So other cases have found the selection and arrangement test to be applicable, namely LA Printex, a lot of cases. There's a whole line of cases where the Ninth Circuit has applied the selection and arrangement test. And when that happens, there is a chance for the plaintiff to win. Uh, the cases, for example, Funky Films, Binet versus Warner Brothers, 2006, 2010, this, the filtration test was applied and the defendants, of course, won. So now, let's look at the 2020 and 2022 cases. So what you have is, in the, two ca in the cases where the plaintiffs prevailed or the, the Ninth Circuit reversed, in all of those cases, the selection and arrangement test was, was applied. In the cases where the defendants won, and the Ninth Circuit affirmed a dismissal, in almost every one of those cases, the selection and arrangement test was not applied, the filtration test was applied. Um, and so that's the main distinction between whether uh, a plaintiff has any chance of winning at all, uh, and whether or not the motion for dismiss is gonna be reversed by the Ninth Circuit or, or, or denied in the first place. Um, and, you know, we, we always argue that, uh, that that it's a, a very intense factual, factual issue. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to compare a screenplay with a, with a movie, uh, but it's, it's very difficult. You have to watch the, the, you have to read the screenplay at least two or three times. You have to watch the movie multiple times. Uh, and then you have to figure out whether something is or is not a similarity. And don't forget, it doesn't have to be exact to be a similarity. Uh, then you have to see whether there's patterns in the first that are repeated in the second. It's a very intense factual analysis, and we use, you know, professors uh, that are in comparative literature and things like that that are, are very used to doing these analyses. I don't think judges are qualified to do them, and I don't think they should be doing them in the motion to dismiss stage. Um, and so, um, you know, um, I guess, did that answer your question? <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe more than answered your question. Uh, uh, yeah, right. No, the question is, uh, what do you see happening in the Ninth Circuit? Is there any explanation for what appears to be a back and forth? And I think Stephen is saying it depends. The answer is it depends which test the court decides to apply. Basically, yes. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, I, I would ask you, um, how do you think experts help or can help a court, assuming it's going to apply the filtration test? Uh, how would you have an expert deal with uh, sense of fair and, and, and can experts opine on what is and what is not protectable and is that not the role of the court? And then you also mentioned you, you don't think judges are qualified to do it, but then do you think a jury is qualified to do it? Well, those were a lot of questions. So. Okay. <laughs> Let me, uh... Let me start with the first clear, one. I do work for a studio, so I'm, I, I, right. even though I am the moderator, but anyway. So let me answer the last one first. I mean, the juries are the ones who hear all the evidence, including expert testimony, and, and I think they're the ones that ultimately should be making those decisions, those factual decisions, uh, after a full trial, and that's what they do. Uh, in terms of what, what uh, experts can opine on, um, one of the things in the um, Pirates of the Caribbean case that the court pointed out was that one of the important things that an expert can apply on is the quali qualitative importance of the similarities um, to the overall work and the success of the work. Uh, and so we, we are big believers that experts do provide at least that. Um, you know, they're able to opine on the issue of qualitative importance. But I think experts are valuable for a lot more than that. Um, a lot of times experts can point out patterns of similarities that we don't even necessarily see uh, that they're able to uh, detect from their um, you know, uh, experience. Um, in terms of whether or not they should say whether something's protectable or unprotectable, I, I don't think that's within the purview of an expert to ultimately say. Um, that, that, that would be for the ultimate trier of fact to make that decision. Um, and also in the um, Pirates of the Caribbean case, the um, judge also said that, that the, uh, the expert could opine on the issue of scenes of fare. Um, and so I do think, for those of you who don't know, scene of fare is something that's uh, basically so common in the genre that it has almost no 
uh, impact for purposes of a, of a substantial similarity analysis. But in the selection and arrangement test, you do consider scenes of fare because you could select and arrange scenes of fare in such a way as to make it a combination, uh, a protectable combination, if you will. So, but nonetheless, uh, experts can opine on the issue of scenes of fare to the extent that you're applying certainly in the filtration test. Um, did I say patterns already? Identifying patterns? No, you didn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. It's useless. And then, um, let's see. I guess that would be that would be it. Elaine, any response? A very quick question. Uh, when I was a law student, uh, I heard that in Second Circuit, right, uh, they have this bifurcated test, uh, copy and uh, unlawful appropriation, right? And in Ninth Circuit, we have access and substantial similarity. Are those two tests the same? The same thing under the different label, uh, labels, or they can come to different conclusions? Thank you. I think uh, they're I'll supposed jump. to be the same test. Uh, so, uh, but uh, that's the question. Because oh, okay. I was just going to say the tests in the Second Circuit and Ninth Circuit are different. They're 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 not the same, and in, in fact, they're different in a lot of different circuits. Uh, um, some circuits have adopted either the second or ninth circuits in some tests, and some circuits have their own tests. But the second circuit definitely has a different test. They have a reasonable observer test, uh, but there's all sorts of permutations of that. Uh, and they kind of have a selection and arrangement test. Some of the cases apply it. Uh, I think, you know, with all due respect to the second circuit, the law is kind of a mess on substantial similarity. The second circuit, but then it's a little bit of a mess in the ninth circuit as well with these two um, these two tests, which are mutually exclusive. Selection and arrangement test includes unprotectable elements. So the filtration test excludes them, so they're mutually exclusive. Uh, and so the ninth circuit also has conflicting tests, and, and the second circuit has uh, has multiple tests as well, depending on the circumstances.